Let's do it. Woo! All right, everyone. Welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, I'm delighted to welcome someone who I've wanted to speak to for quite some time. I stumbled across one of his TED Talks that he did, which has just blown up uh, all over the internet. Uh, he is a very, very well-known figure. Uh, his name is Johan Hari. Now, if that name doesn't ring a bell for some of you, you're about to get to know more about him, but he's a British writer who has, has authored two New York Times bestselling books, soon to be a third, I have no doubt, because he's working on it currently. Uh, they, have, they have been translated into 34 languages and have been praised by a broad range of people from Oprah uh, to Elton John to Naomi Klein, just to name a few of the famous people. Uh, his first book, Chasing the Scream, The First and Last Days of the War on Drugs, was adapted into the Golden Globe award-winning film, The United States vs. Billie Holiday. Uh, Johan was also executive producer of the movie, uh, it was also later adapted into a separate eight-part documentary series, uh, which is going to be released later this year, actually. Uh, and your second book, Lost Connections, Uncovering the Real Causes of Depression and the Unexpected Solutions, was described by the British Journal of uh, General Practice as the one of the most important texts of recent years. Uh, and it's shortlisted for an award by the British Medical Association. And your third book, which is going to be released next year, um, no idea what the name is yet, but we'll, <laughs> but I'm excited to hear about it. And like I said in the very beginning, your TED Talk has been viewed more than, get this number through your head, people, 75 million times. And I was one of those views. I was probably like, I'd say about a hundred of them. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm probably like two of them. Um, the first is named everything you think you know about addiction is wrong. And that's the one that I absolutely love. And the second is titled, this could be why you are depressed or anxious. And my goodness, you've been featured in so many different magazines. You've been on different podcasts. And that is why it is a real pleasure and treat to welcome Johan Hari to the Storybox podcast today. Uh, I'm so happy to be with you, Jay. I cannot fucking tell you how much I wish I was in Australia with you right now instead of in lockdown Britain. But never mind. I'm really happy to be with you even through the magical screen. Man, it's it's great to have you here. I, I mean that from the top of my heart. I don't even know why people actually say the bottom of their heart. I think the top of their heart is like more reflective of, you know, it's better <laughs> in my opinion, at least. But What's the cl current climate like for you in, in, in lockdown? What's it been like? Well, I've actually spent a lot of uh, the plague year in Las Vegas for something that I'm writing. Um, and Vegas is a kind of a weird place to spend a plague, partly because it is full of people whose response to a global pandemic is to say, this is a great time to go to Vegas. <laughs> so uh, it's been really, and I've been spending a lot of time, uh, I'm not allowed to talk about it, but it's for a future book. Um, investigating something really weird that's happening in Vegas. So uh, my play gear has been slightly odd, but uh, but kind of interesting. And uh, now I'm back, it, back in Britain. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out if, um, if I go back to the US very soon for the Oscars or not, because the um, a film that I was involved in has been nominated for an Oscar. So uh, they are claiming, the Academy is claiming that they are doing like the full Oscar ceremony in person in the Dolby Theatre and in Union Station in LA. And I'm like, mm, maybe it's not a good idea to stage a massive super spreader event in one of the cities that's been worse affected by COVID-19. But I cannot, I know this is like a first world problem for like, you know, anyone during this pandemic, but I'm trying to decide, is it worth risking death in order to be at the Oscars or is it better to just survive but not attend the Oscars? Anyway, I know that's like literally the most privileged problem that anyone in the world has right now, but so I'm just trying to figure that out. Anyway, I've got to get back to Vegas anyway. So it makes kind of makes sense to go to, to LA. But uh, yeah, so those are my tedious dilemmas at the moment. Can I just say congratulations for your film being nominated for an Oscar? That's been a dream of mine ever since I was eight years old, believe it or not, uh, because just a little bit of a fun fact about me, I wanted to be a filmmaker ever since I was eight years old and it was because of the Princess Bride film and Steven Spielberg. Um, so Baby J, had very good, Baby J had very good taste. Sorry? Little Baby J had good taste in films. Oh, he did. He really did, man. And yeah. it was, it was a love of stories, bro. Like, did you not? It was, um, I was, I was 
taught from a very young age. This is what a good story is. I was brought up on like Ricky Tiki Tavi. I don't know if you've heard of that or Uncle, yeah. Tom, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, I've got a book actually in, in, in there, like all these stories. So when it comes to uh, watching movies, I know what's a good, good story or a good film and what's not. <laughs> and my friend- It's funny, you know, it's funny because you've got the image of Jurassic Park there and someone, I can't remember who said this, I think it was a comedian said recently, when she watched all the Jurassic Park sequels, she was like, it's totally unrealistic that despite every disaster, they would keep reopening Jurassic Park. But now with COVID, she's like, oh yeah, they would definitely have just kept reopening it, right? <laughs> That's right, yeah. Uh, 100%, man. Um, Johan, I, I want to dive into your backstory in just a moment. But the very first question I, I normally ask all my guests is, what does success look like for you? You know, it's really interesting. I actually think my view on this slightly changed in the research for one of my books about depression and anxiety. And when you ask that, I, first thing that came into my mind is um, a woman called Brett Ford, who, who she's an academic. She was at Berkeley when I interviewed her. I think she's in Toronto now, Dr. Brett Ford. And um, mm. she was involved in doing this really kind of simple research that led to a really unexpected result. So what they wanted to figure out was, Let's say you, Jay, decided you were going to spend two hours a day from now on deliberately trying to make yourself happier. They wanted to figure out, would you actually become happier? And they did this research in four countries. I mean, it was a big team, so Brett was just part, just part, one, of, part of one of the teams. They did it in the United States, in Japan, in Russia, and in Taiwan. And what they found at first makes no sense. In the US, if you try deliberately to make yourself happier, you do not become happier on average. Mm. In the other countries, if you try to make yourself happier, in the main, you do become happier. And at first they're like, well, how can that be? That's, that's weird. What's going on there? So they started doing more digging. And what they discovered is in the US, and I'm pretty sure this is true in Britain and Australia as well. In the US, if you try to make yourself happier, in the main, you do something for yourself. You work harder to get more money or get a promotion. You treat yourself by going shopping, You whatever it is. You, you do something for you, right? In the other countries, in the main, so Russia, uh, J Japan, and, and Taiwan, in the main, if you try to make yourself happier, you do something for someone else, your friends, your family, your community, right? And so we have an instinctively, kind of the fancy term would be an individualistic idea of what it means to be happy, right? I get happiness by getting gains for me, right? In the other countries, they have an instinctively collective idea of happiness. In the main, you get happier if the group around you gets happier, if the people around you gets happier. And it turns out, uh, and of course there's exceptions in both countries, but in the main, and, and it turns out this story, this individualistic story that we have a happiness just doesn't work very well, right? For very good reasons. If, if, if you think about where we evolved, right? We evolved um, as tribal bands on the savannas of Africa. If those, if our ancestors had been worried primarily about making themselves as individuals happy, you and me wouldn't be having this conversation and Australia would be overrun with, you know, the massive creatures that were there before uh, our predecessors killed them, right? The, 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 just like bees evolved to live in a hive, humans evolved to live in a tribe, and we evolved to serve our tribe, right? And we're really the first humans ever to tell this individualistic story. So for me, I would say there were long periods of my life, I was never like an extreme individualist, you know, I was never like a kind of Donald Trump style narcissist or something, but there were definitely periods of my life where I would have thought success meant, you know, individual acclaim, right? Whatever that means, you know, I was never someone who's particularly worried about money either, but uh, no, particularly obsessed with money. But for me, it would have meant people praising me, uh, you know, garlands, all of that sort of thing. And of course, there's still that part of my character, don't get me wrong. Um, but increasingly, when I think about um, success now, I don't think that's a good way to gauge success, partly because it doesn't make me happy. Not really. It can give you a sugar high, but it doesn't make you happy. Mm. So funny enough, thinking about the Oscars, right? My 12 year old self would have thought that was like the pinnacle of human existence, right? Yeah. Maybe part of saying that wins an Oscar. Actually, after I go, after I go to the Oscars, I'm going to go to Vegas and I'm going to spend a lot of time with someone, an incredible person I've got to know over the last 10 years, 
who lived in the tunnels beneath Las Vegas, the drainage tunnels. And we've been through a lot together and um, I've been able to help her. And she's an incredible human being, her name's Shay. And that is a much, that means far more than any of the kind of fancy and glitzy forms of success. And um, so I would say my, my sense of success has, has adjusted and it's more about, well, do the people I love and value, are they, are they okay? Am I, you know, it's funny. I just, um, the other day I rewatched it. If you've seen It's a Wonderful Life, the yeah, film. Yeah. Yeah. It. It's such a great, it, it's such a profound film. It's wonderful. I haven't seen it in years. And then I decided to rewatch it when I couldn't sleep. And, um, for people who don't know, it's about um, a man is about to kill himself, played by, played by James Stewart. Mm. And an angel appears to him named Clarence, who's trying to earn his wings in heaven. Mm. And he decides to show the Jimmy Stewart character what all the people who know how they would have turned out if he'd never been born, if Jimmy Stewart had never been born. And, uh, and I don't want to ruin the film for you guys, so you should watch it. But there's a line towards the end where the angel says, or is that the Jimmy Stewart says, no man is a failure who has friends. I think it's one of the greatest lines in any film ever and one of the truest lines. And I think success is, you know, do you have friends? Is the world better than it would have been if you'd never been born? Are more people better off and fewer people harmed? Um, and that's a high bar to meet, right? That's a very high bar to meet. Actually much higher than the glitzy accolades and making money and all of that shit, right? Mm -hmm. It's a much higher bar to say, well, how many people are really better off because I've been here? Um, so yeah, that, that's how I would define success. I think it's also to your point of we're kind of like chasing this high, but then when we do achieve that thing that we've always wanted to achieve, it's almost like what's next. It's always like this constant cycle of us trying to chase the next high and the next high. And it's like, where is the, the real fulfillment there? And I think people are chasing satisfaction rather than fulfillment. So I love how you define your your definition of success being it's about relationships, it's about being in service to literally our friends because at the end of the day when the stuff is all gone, when that, that chasing for trying to make ourselves feel good, trying to be happy, when that's all gone, what's left? It's us and other people. And if we can't learn to get along with other people, then I guess we're really failing in our life. And I love the It's a Wonderful Life um, film. It's such a poetic definition of really how a good life should look like. You know, you are you were placed on this earth for a purpose, and that is to be you, to be authentically you, not to be someone else, not to consistently try to ch chase this high that is not going to really fulfill you at the end of the day. Um, so interesting, Jake, because, you know, what you're saying makes me think about one of the most amazing people I met and got to know from my book about depression and connections. It's mm. a guy called Professor Tim Kasser. Uh, and basically for thousands of years, right, philosophers had said, if you think life is about money and status and showing off, you're going to feel like shit, right? Yeah. It's not exactly a quote from Confucius, but that is basically what Confucius said. But, but, but weirdly, nobody had ever scientifically investigated this until this guy called Tim Kasser. You should type the interview, by the way. I can introduce you if you like. And, 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 and Professor Kasser, who was at Knox College in Illinois, really researched this question for 30 years. Um, and, and he discovered, I mean, there's loads of things he discovered, but for me, the, the, relevant to what you're saying, there's two kind of headlines. Firstly, he discovered that it's true. The philosophers were right. The more you think life is about money and status, the more likely you are to become depressed, to become anxious, to have poor relationships with other people, a whole range of problems. And secondly, he discovered that as a society, as a culture, we have become much more driven by these values. Really all throughout my lifetime, I'm 42, there's been a huge increase in these values. And the way I start to think of it is a bit like, um, you know, we all know that junk food has taken over our diets and made us physically sick, right? I don't say there's any superiority. I literally, there's a McDonald's bag in the corner of this room. But, but, but just like junk food has taken over our values and made us physically sick, a kind of junk values have taken over our minds and made us mentally sick. You know, there used to be a book called Chicken Soup for the Soul. But in a way, we've been sort of fed KFC for the soul, right? We've, we've been 
trained to look for happiness in all the wrong places. We've been, and, and this is really from the moment we're born, we're immersed in this story. More 18 month old children know what the McDonald's M means than know their own last name, right? Mm. We're immersed in this machinery that says, if you don't feel good, treat yourself. Solution is do something for you, buy something for you, be you, right? Not be us, be we, be the group be you, right? We're immersed in this, this kind of individualism. And it's another one of the reasons why, um, you, you know, as uh, Professor Kasser put it really well to me, he said, we live in a machine that is designed to get us to neglect what is important about life, right? right. That this whole machinery of consumerism, we don't say you can't get, some, we all need some basics and, and there can't, that there can't be some pleasure from shopping. Of course there can, but in some ways it feels almost like a kind of a really banal thing to say, no one, none of you guys are going to, lie on your deathbed and think about all the shoes you bought and all the likes you got on Instagram, right? You're going to think about moments of love and meaning and connection in your life. But we live in a machine that's designed to get us to neglect that. And Professor Kasser discovered some really important ways we can disrupt that that I'm happy to talk about. I'm sure we'll get to that. Or, yeah. Yeah, let's let's unpack this thought a little bit because I, I've always been curious about why that has been the case. Like if you look at the ancient philosophers talking about this exact thing, and why do you think that people didn't listen? Why do you think we've just, we've sort of gone back and we're sort of, I think we're hurting ourselves. And I guess, it's, is there this sense of naivety around it or do we know, but we just don't care? I don't think we should blame ourselves, right? We all have within us two sets, broadly two sets of motives, right? The scientific term for them at extrinsic and intrinsic motives. So imagine, uh, let's think of one. Imagine you play the piano, right? Mm -hmm. If you play the piano in the, I'm totally unmusical, but if you play the piano in the morning because you love it and it gives you joy and you feel a sense of flow and pleasure when you're playing the piano, that's what's called an intrinsic motive for playing the piano, right? You're not doing it to get anything out of it. You're doing it because of that moment is meaningful to you. Okay, now imagine you play the piano, not because you love it, but in a dive bar to pay the rent or um, because your parents are massively pressuring you because it's their dream and they want you to be some piano maestro, right? That would be an extrinsic reason to play the piano. So you're not, you're not doing it for the experience itself. You're doing it to get something out of it further down the line, right? Mm -hmm. Now we're all a mix of intrinsic and extrinsic motives. Of course, like you have to be to get through life and actually both are necessary. But what we had is a move much more heavily towards extrinsic motives, right? Think about something as simple as, uh, fun enough, in Vegas, um, before just before the plague, uh, <laughs> plague arrived, um, I went to Elton John's last night at Caesar's Palace, right? He obviously had a residency there for many years. This incredible thing to see, and he's such an amazing performer, and it was a great thing to see. And I would say a good 10% of that audience did not fucking look at Elton because they're sitting there filming it on their phones, right? And you want to turn to them and go, and I'm not judging these people because I've done things like that in the past. You want to say to them, no one wants to see your shitty video of Elton John. If they want to see a video of Elton John, there are literally thousands of videos on YouTube. Why are they doing that? They're doing that because they want to display to other people that they're depriving themselves of the actual experience of seeing Elton John live, which they will never get again, right? Hmm. In order to get the inferior experience of uh, showing off that they were that, right? Now, where do those values come from? There's a degree to which they're natural, but they are but intrinsic motive. Professor Kasser's research shows intrinsic motives are quite fragile. So we've all got them, but you've got to understand, we live in an extreme capitalist machinery, very, I mean, there's never been anything like this in human history mm. that is constantly, you know, I forget the figures on this, but the number of advertising messages that people are exposed to every day, right? This is, and then of course we internalize the messages, we impose them on each other. And um, so we, like Professor Kasser says, we live in this machine. So I think that machinery wants us to blame ourselves. They want, it wants us to feel like shit and then, and then we'll cheer ourselves up by buying more shit, right? Yeah. But, but, but we should not blame ourselves. We should, uh, a, protect ourselves against this machinery and there's very practical ways for us Kassa, found to do that I can talk about. And also we should dismantle that machinery. For example, in the research for Lost Connections, I went to Sao Paulo in Brazil where they just banned outdoor advertising. There's no outdoor advertising in Sao Paulo anymore, right? They realized the whole city was fucking covered with it. Um, it was doing people's heads in. Just get rid of it, right? They got rid of it. People feel much better. In London, there was... Um, 
a campaign. At, well, so there, so this must be three or four years ago now. There was a series of ads on in the tube in the London Underground, the subway system, where uh, it basically put like these impossibly like slim women and insanely buff men. And the ad said, are you beach body ready? And it was an ad for some protein shake or something. Uh, oh, the clear implication being, if you don't look like these guys and this, these women, you're not ready to go to the beach, right? Of course, that makes everyone feel like shit, including, by the way, the people who look as good as that, because they're, you know, they're really, you don't look like that naturally, right? That's a huge amount of effort and work and all credit to them. I like looking at them as well. But the, 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 um, and there was just, and that advertising was just banned, right? Because they just said, this is making people feel like shit. You can't just wantonly make people feel bad. Um, so there's all sorts of things we can do in a practical way to deal with this. And obviously go through lots in the book, but, but we, the thing we've got to do instead of blaming ourselves, take on the machine and disrupt the machine. Cause one of the good things, you know, the reason I wrote lost connections is because I'm 42 and every single year I've been alive, depression and anxiety have increased in Britain, in the U S in Australia. In fact, Australia is almost the highest in the whole world for yeah. this problem. And I'm, I've got some thoughts about that because I've spent a fair bit of time in Australia, but the, the, um, and I wanted to understand why is this happening, right? And what's ha for so long, we have been blaming ourselves. We've either been saying there's something wrong with me, I'm crazy, I'm weak, I'm not strong enough, or we've been blaming our own biology, saying, oh, this is just a problem in my brain. Now, for some people, there's some biological contribution to depression and anxiety, and we can, I'm sure we'll talk about that. But actually, the evidence shows, and, and the leading medical body in the whole world, the World Health Organization, has concluded Overwhelmingly, depression and anxiety are being caused by factors in the way we live. And we can deal with that. We can disrupt the machine that's making us feel so shit. That machine was made by human beings, and it can be an, actually a very small number of very powerful human beings who get very rich off it. And that machine can be dismantled by human beings. Mm. This is going to be a, a very fascinating conversation. I want to unpack, like you mentioned, Australia is one of the highest when it comes to depression. Why, what are your thoughts on that? Why is that the case specifically? Um, and where does depression, I, I, you mentioned there's chemical imbalances and I 100% agree with you on that, but where ultimately does depression actually begin? Is it all these, these bombarding messages? Is it trauma? Where does it actually start? So there's a few things in what you said. Um, remind me to come back to where does it start? So in terms of Australia, there's a really good Australian sociologist who's done great work on this called Professor Hugh Mackay, who is much more insightful than me. And I really recommend that you talk to him and people check out his, his work because he's really looked into the specific Australian aspect. But one factor that we know is that Australia has very high levels of loneliness and loneliness is one of the main causes of depression. So I think, and this kind of in a way overlaps with the, I mean, prompt me to talk more about loneliness, um, but so one of the problems I have with the way we've talked about depression for all my lifetime and all your lifetime is we've told people a wildly simplistic story. When I was a teenager and I went to my doctor and I said that I had a feeling like pain was leaking out of me, and I didn't know what to do. My doctor said to me, well, we know why people feel like this. Some people just have a chemical imbalance in their brains. You're clearly one of them. All we need to do is give you some drugs. You'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And my doctor was a decent, well-meaning person and Chemical antidepressants do give some people some relief. Some other people have very bad response to them. Um, uh, and we should have a truthful, complicated conversation about antidepressants as knowledge they help some people, harm some people. Um, but we also need to acknowledge that that story my doctor told me is not, uh, that, it, that it's just a problem in your brain, is not backed by the best scientific evidence. There is a biological contribution. There are some biological factors that can make it worse. Your genes can make you more sensitive to these problems, just like some people's genes make it easier for them to put on weight and some people can eat, you know, 20 Big Macs and stay skinny. Um, and, and there are real changes that happen in your brain when you become depressed that can make it harder to get out. But as I say, the scientific evidence shows, and this is not controversial, this is in the psychiatry textbooks, this is the position of the leading medical body in the world, the World Health Organization, is most of the factors are factors in the way we live. So what we don't wanna do is replace an overly simplistic biological story with an overly simplistic story of one other cause, right? So actually what I learned is there's scientific evidence for nine different causes of depression and anxiety that I go through in the book. Um, 
and they're all real and they're all play out to some, you know, they play out in different people's lives to different degrees. So there's no, you can't just blanket say depression is caused by X. You need to listen to the individual. You need to pay attention to the individual and you need to weigh that uh, and you need to apply the best scientific evidence to, to what we know about that individual's individual's life. So I don't think we should say there's, there's one, and that makes it, again, makes it hard to look at, you should look at Australia. Australia has very high levels of depression. Some of that is for a good reason, which is that Australia has lower stigma than depression and about depression and anxiety than a lot of other countries. So it may be that Australians are more candid about their depression and anxiety. Uh, I mean, that's certainly going to, to some degree, raise the the uh, figure. Mm. Uh, but I don't think that's the only reason. We do know Australians have unusually high levels of loneliness, um, which we know is, and there's lots of evidence that go through in the book, This, and I can talk about how if you want that causes depression and anxiety. So I think that, but Professor Mackay, Professor Mackay argues it's partly that Australians have quite a, um, it's years since I talked to him, and I didn't write about it, so I don't want to characterise his views wrongly, but if I remember right, he talks a bit about uh, Australians have a quite distanced relationship from the natural world in which they live and disconnection from nature can and can can be very powerful um well can cause depression and anxiety so i think there's a whole range of things there i think australians as well we kind of have this attitude of she'll be right mate uh and then we don't we don't really want to talk about it because there's that fear that we associate with it because we don't want to uh put our burdens on a on a mate or you know that sort of thing but i found your 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 link towards loneliness quite fascinating. Why? Why is um, most of Australians? Why? Why is there an increased amount of loneliness? Where did that happen? It's a complicated question. So I interviewed um, one of the people. I, one of the leading experts in the world on loneliness was this guy called Professor John Cassiopo, who mm-hmm. was at the University of Chicago. Who I spent a lot of time interviewing. He sadly died not that long ago, and it's um, a real loss because he wasn't an old guy. Um, and Professor Cassiopo, you know, I learned so much from him. I remember him saying to me, why are we alive? Why do we exist, right? One key reason is that our ancestors on the savannas of Africa, they weren't bigger than the animals they took down a lot of the time. They weren't faster than the animals they took down a lot of the time. But they were much better at banding together into groups and cooperating, right? This is our superpower as a species we band together. And increasingly in Western culture, and I think this is unusually acute in Australia, for reasons that I think you would understand better than me, Jay, particularly among Australian men, we have disbanded our tribes and we've told ourselves a story that you should go it alone, right? Yeah. That the, the ideal person is like a John Wayne cowboy mm-hmm. uh, kind of riding across the savannas on their own, not savannas, the, um, the West on their own. Um, actually, by the way, actual cowboys didn't live like that. They lived in very fucking closely close tribes, right? Because otherwise they would have died. Um, and actual John Wayne was really depressed. And anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, but but so I think we've told ourselves a bit like the way we told ourselves a story with junk values that doesn't meet our deeper needs, our deeper nature. You know, everyone knows they have natural physical needs. Obviously, you need food. You need water, you need shelter, you need clean air. If I took those things away from you, you'd be screwed. Yeah. But there's equally strong evidence that all human beings have natural psychological needs. You need to feel you belong. You need to feel your life has meaning and purpose. You need to feel that people see you and value you. You need to feel you've got a future that makes sense, right? And this culture we built is good at lots of things. I'm glad to be alive today. How incredible that you're literally as far away on the planet Earth as you can get. And we're looking into each other's eyes, right? It's amazing. But we've been getting less and less good at meeting people's deep underlying psychological needs. And I think I do think that is particularly true in Australia. There's a quite alienated relationship, particularly among men, and Australian men have off the scale levels of depression and anxiety. Um, there's a story of uh, you should be a self-determining individualist, that if you're in pain, you should push it down and deal with it yourself that um, it's a failing and a fl- And this is a really interesting thing that Professor Cassiopo taught me. So he was studying loneliness and he was looking at, when they, re- when they began to research loneliness, when he started doing it, it must be about well, a bit more than 30 years ago now. He was looking at this, it, it, this sounds odd, but 
it's actually turned out to be quite hard to define loneliness in order to study it. Everyone, if you say to them, do you feel lonely, knows what you're saying, right? And especially at the moment because of um, the plague, we, we all, we all um, no, we're particularly acutely feeling this at the moment. But, but weirdly, when you try to define it, it becomes quite hard because actually the instinctive thing, certainly my first thought, you said define it, you go, well, someone who's alone, right? But it turns out the number of people you speak to every day does not correlate very well with how lonely you feel, which seems a bit odd at first, right? So actually some people speak to um, loads of people and still feel lonely. Some people only speak to one person and don't feel lonely. First, yeah. Cassiopeia was like, that's weird. What's, what's going on? And what he discovered is it's not the number of people you interact with. It's the amount of reciprocity you have between them and you. So imagine uh, you're in a hospital bed, right? Um, you're on your own. You can push a button and the nurse will come and help you. But you still feel lonely, even though the nurse is there, because you don't have a reciprocal relationship with the nurse. You can't push the button and say, hey, nurse, can I help you? Do you need any help today? Right. What a, 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 a reciprocal relationship is where you feel the other person sees you and gives to you and you feel you see them and give to them. So it's got to be a relationship where you feel you depend on each other or just a relationship where uh, either you speak to them, but you don't depend on each other. Like think about uh, I first came to Sydney five years ago, right? Um, I'd never been to Sydney before. I remember the very first day I was there walking around and it was busy streets, but I felt quite lonely because I didn't know anyone, right? So I was surrounded by people. I could have easily talked to people, got into a shop or whatever, but I felt lonely because there was no reciprocal relationships. This is also why at the end of a relationship, often you feel really lonely. The other person is physically there, right? You can see them. If you're lucky, you can still have sex with them, but you don't, um, you don't feel any more that you can give to them and they can give to you and you feel acutely lonely. So loneliness isn't about how many people you speak to, it's about how reciprocal you are and actually how reciprocal your relationships are. And I think particularly if you have a very individualistic blokey culture, I've been following all the stuff that's been going on with Scott Morrison and the rape uh -huh. uh, controversy at the moment. Yeah. If you have a very blokey culture that's about, you know, bottle it up, I'm about me, individualism, uh, and by the way, there's lots of things I love about Australia. I don't want to sound like I'm dissing the country. There's great things about it. But um, I think that will particular that will be a, a culture that particularly breeds a kind of depression and anxiety. And it'll be a particularly difficult kind of depression and anxiety because people will feel depressed and anxious, but not understand why. And this is something you see with these, when you have mistaken values that don't meet your needs as a human being, and I include myself in this for a lot of my life, it leads to one of the really painful things about it is it leads to a problem where you feel bad, but you don't understand why. And very often you double down on the mistaken values. You know, I made a load of money. I, I worked hard. I got status, but I don't feel good. I must have not earned enough money. I must not have enough followers on Instagram or whatever it might be. It always reminds me of there was a, um, I think it's Buster Keaton, a silent film star, I forget which one. And there's this, this old footage of him and it's a, a comedy thing. And he starts to sink in quicksand and his feet are sinking. So to get his feet out, he reaches in with his hands to pull out his feet. But of course that means his hands get stuck. And then he reaches in with his head to pull out his arms and then he's completely gone, right? Mm. And it's a bit like that with these values. These values make us feel bad, extreme individualism, junk values. And then when we feel bad, we're like, shit, well, I must have not pursued them the right way, right? Or I didn't pursue them enough. I didn't pursue them hard enough. And it makes you feel worse and worse. So I think, I mean, there's lots of other reasons that we'll get to as well. These are just two of the nine that I write about in Lost Connections, but I do think they're important ones. Mm. So what are the right kind of values that we should be adopting, not just in our own lives, but being able to see that in, I guess, the rest of the population to move away from being so depressed, being so anxious all the time. And I think you're 100% right. Um, I've noticed there's been this massive disconnect towards values, the right kinds of values being the right kind of leader in society. And if it's anything that we've seen with the Scott Morrison uh, sexual assault thing that's going on, more people are starting to realize it and standing up and saying, hey, this isn't right. Let's do something about it. Um, but then you've got men that are being subdued and saying, oh, because of this, this is happening in, in parliament, it's going to happen anywhere, everywhere else now. And I'm, I'm, I'm no longer going to be, uh, my, my freedoms as a, as a man is going to be also subdued now as well. 
and the female is sort of like taking taking the lead if that makes sense. I don't know if you've seen the same thing, but um, I could be totally wrong here and I don't mean to offend or get it wrong in any way, but I've just, I've just been noticing like it's not a, it's not a necessarily a bad thing or is it a bad thing? I, I don't know. I'm trying to figure that out for myself. So I think there's several things to what you said, just to answer the first bit. So what can we do? There's loads of things we can do. And the last third of the book is about the, the answer to that question. But I'll give you one example that relates to some of the stuff we've been talking about. So Professor Casser did this super interesting experiment that people, everyone watching and listening can, can actually try themselves. It's, it's a good time to try it. So there's a guy called Nathan Dungan, who um, I interviewed. He's a, he's a financial advisor in Minneapolis. And Nathan's job is was just to kind of, and is, to give people advice on like personal budgeting. So like, you know, your family budget, that kind of thing. And um, one day Nathan got a call from a school. It was kind of middle-class school, wasn't fancy, wasn't poor. Uh, and the school was like, look, we've got a problem, will you help us? Um, the kids in our school are obsessed with getting like the latest Nike sneakers, the latest iPhone. I mean, it wouldn't have been the iPhone then, but whatever it was, it was a few years ago. Um, and when they when they can't when their parents can't afford it, the kids go mental, and it's really causing problems at home and at the school. And they said to Nathan, "Will you just come in and teach the kids about how to budget?" Right. So Nathan comes in, he talks to the kids, and quite quickly realizes these kids don't give a shit about budgeting. Right? They're like, "I need that phone," uh, and, he, and he's really struck by this. Right? Or well, I need that these sneakers. I need this fancy thing. And he's like, "What's what's going on here?" So he started to learn about Professor Casser's work. And they teamed up to do a quite simple experiment. They got a group of parents and teenagers to come in uh, once every few weeks for, I think, six months. And the first time they did it, first meeting, they get the group, they get around together, uh, they break into smaller groups at various points, but they get around together and they just say, just draw up a list of everything you've got to have. And they don't define what that means. They just say, everything you've got to have. And of course, everyone says like food and home and stuff first. But quite quickly, people are saying like Nike sneakers. Quite often, the parents are naming things that no reasonable person has to have, right? And then Nathan said, okay, now discuss and write down how you would feel if you got this thing, right? How would your life be different if you got the thing you've got to have, the Nike sneakers or whatever? What's fascinating is none of the kids gave the kind of apparent reason for the object, right? No one said oh, I need Nike, I want, the Nike sneakers will be great because I'll be able to jump higher because I'm a basketball player. Or, you know, it'll be great if I have the iPhone, whatever the latest iPhone is, because I'll be able to stay in touch. No one said that. People said things like, well, other people will envy me. Or I'll belong to the group. I'll be part of the group then. It doesn't take long to get people to say that out loud before they're like, hmm, why do I feel I have to have a piece of plastic on my feet or, um, you know, a piece of, chunk of metal so that people will like me, right? So the first stage is just taking apart some of the junk values, getting people to see these are ideas that were planted in your head. The campaign in London to stop that, you know, um, are, are you beach body ready? Their slogan was advertising shits in your head, right? <laughs> and it was basically what Nathan was trying to do is show someone shit in your head, right? And that's why you've got these ideas there. But the second bit to me was much more interesting. I mean, that's important, but the second bit to me was much more interesting. What they did was they got these people, I think it was the second session. I forget, I might be getting this detail wrong. They got, they said to people, can you just write down and talk about a moment in your life you've actually felt was meaningful? Mm. And different people named different things. For some people, it was playing the guitar. For some people, it was reading with their kids, taking them to the beach. For me, it'd be writing, whatever it might be, right? And then they said, how could you change your life so you build more of it around seeking these moments of meaning and less around these kind of junk values? And so the group becomes, they have to check in every few weeks to talk about how they've done it. So it becomes a kind of Alcoholics Anonymous for consumerism and for junk values, right? where people, we don't have these conversations very often in our culture. What's meaningful to you? What matters? What have been moments of meaning and purpose? How can you have more of that, less of Instagram, less of advertising? What was incredible was just having those conversations, they monitored people's values at the beginning and the end. 
led to a really significant shift in people's values, which we know correlates with lower anxiety, depression, and all sorts of other problems. So to me, that's something we can all do, right? We can all have those conversations. We could all have an organized way, have a group Zoom with your friends once every, um, once every, once a month or whatever it is. I do it with several of my friends. What's meaningful? What have you done? What matters to you? How can you do more of that? What is the bullshit that's diverting you? How can you have less of that? So, and, and one of the things you learn from that is a, a bigger thing as well about we can take on this machine, right? This thing that's making us feel like shit, that's not some natural force, right? It's not like a hurricane, although actually hurricanes aren't natural forces anymore because of global warming. But so that aside, you know, that, 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 you know, they're not, uh, this is not some, you know, um, natural force. This is something that was invented by other people so they could make a lot of money out of making you feel bad, right? Mm -hmm. Think about something as simple as like, um, Dove, the uh, what they call deodorant people, had a campaign a few years ago. <laughs> I mean, this was so crude that it caused it a backlash. Um, but they had a campaign that was about uh, saying to women, do you ever feel your armpits are really ugly and disgusting? Well, we've got the treatment for it, right? Which, of course, up until that point, no one thought their armpits were fucking, unless they were met very unwell, you know, um, that, you know, no one thought that, right? And that's how advertising works. It's like the ultimate frenemy, right? It says, oh, babe, I think you're great. If only you didn't stink. I think you're great, right? And we've got to identify these forces. And it's not enough to know that know them because actually they work on you even if you know that they're doing it. We've got to dismantle them. There's no reason why we should have a society built around so many things that make us feel so shit, right? Just ban a lot of it. It's not necessary. It doesn't make us feel good. It doesn't serve a positive function in the society. Get rid of it. It's what they did in Sao Paulo. They felt better. Mm. There's also a lot of video games as well that kids are playing that there is psychological elements to it. They actually get psychologists in and when they're developing the game is like, how can we put messages in here, secret messages that are going to get into the psyche of the young child? It's going to teach them, but then all, all it's doing is, okay, when it, when it comes down to it, they just want to be alone in their room. They don't want to have that connection with other people. And there's an increased amount of young people that are huge into video games. I'm not against it, but they're huge into video games and they're depressed. They're anxious all the time. They, they hibernate in their rooms. Um, I was never much into video games myself, but that's just one area because we're, social media is another big area. Then you walk out on the street and you got advertisements galore. Uh, it's kind of like you're, for example, uh, I love Ben and Jerry's ice cream, right? And they've got oh. this this great looking person advertising Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And you're like, well, if I eat Ben and Jerry's ice cream, I can still look like that person that's on the on the poster. And I guarantee you, he or she did not eat any fucking Ben and Jerry's in the run up exactly. to that post graphic. Or you, see, or you see the video and you know how they don't, they don't even take a big scoop. They take a small little scoop and right. they, eat, they eat that. I would love to see someone in an advertisement eat the whole damn thing <laughs> and how they feel straight after because you're giving people the wrong kind of impression, but they do that so they can sell you 1,000% right, so they can sell a product so they can make money. But what I'm always curious about is how do the top people feel at the end of the day that they are actually changing people's lives this way and causing more and more people to be depressed, anxious, stressed out, you name it. Like that just... But in a sense, so those people are... So you have to see those people as operating in a wider structure, right? It's perfectly legitimate to morally criticize them and I would as well. But you... Mm. so. If I'm the head of Ben & Jerry's, right, in the current economic system we have, I have responsibility to my, to my shareholders to maximize profit that quarter, right? Mm. If I don't do that, they'll get rid of me and they'll get someone else. So the temptation is always to blame the individual. And I think in a, in a way that falls into the individualistic trap. And, it, and certainly the individual bears some responsibility. People are responsible for what they choose to do. But for me, I'm more interested about what's the structure that is making humans behave in this dysfunctional way? And how do we actually change that structure that does that, right? A lot of that, think about advertising. Like I say, we live in democracies, loose democracies, but democracies. We should simply not allow those things. We don't allow lead paint, 
right? For many years, going back to ancient Rome, lead was used in piping uh, and obviously later in the 20th century in gasoline and petrol um, and in paint, right? And then it was discovered lead is a fucking horror show if you use it, humans are exposed to it, right? Mm. Um, it causes brain damage. It's one of the reasons why there was a huge increase in violence in the 1960s, because there was so much lead poisoning. Um, and what did we do as a society? We figured out this thing harms us and we banned it. Just got rid of it. There's no there's no new lead pipe and we still got to get rid of some of the old stuff, but there's no, no one lives in a home painted with lead paint now. No one, no one is exposed to lead or gasoline, not in the Western world. There's still some countries, unfortunately, that allow it, but very few. Um, and now we have much less lead poisoning according to the Center for Disease Control. The average IQ of a preschooler in the US has gone up by five points simply because of the ban on lead paint, right? and lead, um, leaded petrol. So we can choose to do these things. We live in societies that have chosen to do that with lots of things, right? Uh, there are lots of things that harm people. We don't allow people to do them. Um, so we have to continue that fight uh, about things that fuck with our heads as well as things that fuck with our bodies. So one thing I do want to mention is I'm not against Ben and Jerry's, by the way, for those people <laughs> wondering. I love my Ben and Jerry's. But At least three of my chins. You look like you have <laughs> never eaten the Ben and Jenny's in your fuck in your fucking life. <laughs> you <bastard. laughs> uh, I have, trust me. I, I once, yeah, I'm gifted with with good genetics and a lot of it. Uh, I love exercising as well, taking care of myself. But don't worry, I do it. I, I exercised. I exercised once in 1987, and I recovered last week. So. <laughs> <that's fine. laughs> I, you reminded me of a very low point in my life, which is that. Um, it happened on Christmas Eve, 2009. I went into my local KFC. I used to live in uh, Brick Lane in East London. And I went in and it was the, it was the afternoon. And um, I said my normal order, which is so disgusting, I won't even repeat it. And the guy <laughs> behind the counter said, oh, Johan, I'm really glad you're here. And I was like, oh, right. And he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he went off behind where they fry the chicken and the chips and everything. And he came back with all the members of staff who were on that day. And he said, um, he gave me, they bought me a fucking massive Christmas card and they'd written in it to our best customer and everyone had written this little personal message. And one of the reasons my heart sank is that wasn't even the fried chicken shop I went to the most. Right? <laughs> I was like, this is bad, man. This is bad. So I never went back to that KFC. And then about two years later, I bumped into that guy and he said, oh, yeah, we haven't seen you in ages. We've seen you just died of a heart attack. I was like, what the fuck is this? So it's very up. So believe me, I'm not judging anyone who eats um, shit. That's essentially my. I mean, I have improved since then, but in fits and starts. But, it's yeah. kind of like a massive yeah. bit of a reality check and slap in the face, isn't it? It was very, very, <laughs> very unfortunate indeed. Oh, yeah. That is a funny story, man. But you brought up something when you're talking about yeah. not not just that story, but uh, previously how you know lead's bad for us. You know we should we should get rid of it. What I'm curious about is why are some things bad for us, whereas other things might not be, but it actually is doing us damage uh, when you really, really look at it? Isn't it kind of like creating double standards at all? I think we've got to understand there's a really interesting guy um, called Professor Timothy Wilson who's done really interesting work on this. He wrote a book called Strangers to Ourselves. It's a re you should definitely interview him. It's a mm. fascinating person. And, and um, what professor, I interviewed him in Charlottesville in Virginia. So Professor Wilson, I haven't written about him, so I might get, I'm gonna be a little bit more hazy on some of the details and I might get some of them wrong, but I get the gist of it right. Mm -hmm. So Professor Wilson has done a whole series of research. I'm gonna write about this in the future. That's why I've, I've interviewed him, but I've not written about it yet. Um, so Professor Wilson has done all this research that shows, we'd, if I ask you why you do something, right, let's think about a, a small, or everyone listening, just think of a small or big decision you've taken, think of a small decision you've taken last week and a big decision, right? If I asked you, why did you do that? Um, we come up, we all come up with stories about why we do things, but it turns out those stories are most often wrong. We don't understand why we do what we do. So he did a whole load of experiments that look at this, but I'll give you an example of one. And as I say, I might get some of the details wrong, but I don't think so. So he did an experiment where they send out a hot young female grad student into a park, and it's important that she's hot for reasons I'll explain. Going to the park, 
And sometimes she stands at the end of a bridge. They had a rickety bridge that, that would make your heartbeat rise, right? As you walked across it. And she stood at one end of it after you'd walked past it and she said to you, hi, I'm doing a questionnaire. Um, could you, could you, could I ask you some questions? And you do the questionnaire, the questionnaire is bullshit. It doesn't matter what it says. And at the end she says, you seem really nice. Can I give, this is my phone number. Give me a call sometime, right? I always felt quite sorry for the men who were part of this experiment. So sometimes she does it at the end of the rickety bridge when their heart, re, heart, heart is beating at the point they meet her, right? And your heart beating fast and being a bit sweaty is also how you feel when you're aroused, right? Mm. Or when you, when you see someone hot that you, you know, you're having flirtation with or whatever. And sometimes he would just go, she would just go up to men who were sitting on a bench who did not have an elevated heart rate and weren't a bit sweaty and, you know, were just calm. And she did exactly the same thing. Can I ask you a questionnaire? And then she gives them the phone number. And they wanted to see, would there be a difference in how often the men phoned the woman, right? And then when they phoned, they actually get told, oh, sorry, you're just part of an experiment. Um, which they must've been gutted. But <laughs> I forget the figure, but it was, you were hugely more likely to phone the woman if you'd walked over the rickety bench, I've walked over the rickety bridge than if you'd just been sitting on a bench, right? Now, what's going on there? If you ask those men, why did you phone? And they said, I, just, I thought she was hot, right? Mm-hmm. But actually, a, a factor they were not aware of, which was the arousal from having walked over the bridge, altered their judgment. It turns out, and there's loads of other experiments, and I can talk about them if you want, but I would say talk to Professor Wilson more than me. Um, what that shows is we don't understand what motivates our behavior very well, right? You think about that when you look at a child, right? My, I was just speaking before I spoke to you, my godson, he's uh, just come back from being away. He's really tired and irritable. I said to him, do you think, do you think you're tired? No, do you, you sound like you're in a bad mood. Do you think that's why? Cause you're tired? No, cause we all know kids don't understand why they feel the way they do. But we imagine we grow up into adults who have this, you know, full self-knowledge and we understand what makes us do things. In psychology, this is called the fundamental misattribution um, thesis, right? Mm. You misattribute why you feel the way you do. So some people say, well, how can it be that this would make me depressed? Because I would know if that was what was making me depressed, right? But actually, although when you hear it, they're pretty common sense, the things I'm saying and the things that I learned from the scientists saying to be fullest connections. But don't assume you know why you're depressed and anxious, right? Now, the problem is a lot of people, when they can't figure out why they're depressed and anxious, assume it must be solely because of some biological problem in their brain or in their genes. Now, like I say, your genes can have some effect. They never write your destiny, but they can make you somewhat more sensitive to these problems. And there are real changes in your brain when you become depressed that can make it harder to get out. But those things still interact with these wider factors and lots of the ones that I write about in those connections that we that we haven't talked about. The most important thing to understand to people is that their pain makes sense, right? You feel this way for reasons. You may not know those reasons immediately. In fact, you probably don't. But with the right help from your friends, from other people, we can figure out what those reasons are and we can deal with them. Mm. I, I think um, I'm curious about, because we don't know what's going on, is that mainly because like even if I was to look at my own life when I was depressed, I knew that I was depressed, but I didn't really know exactly why I was. And I boiled it down to a lack of awareness. Is that mainly the case for a lot of people? I think the problem with saying it's a lack of awareness is it again that can sat I know this is not the way in which you mean it at all. Mm. That can sound again like an individual flaw, right? It's like, well, you weren't aware of the problem and that's why. I would put it differently. I think it's that we have been told stories about our pain that are sometimes wrong. And like the example that depressed people are just weak or sometimes hugely oversimplified, like the idea it's just a chemical imbalance in your brain, which no reputable scientist says that's the sole cause of depression or even the primary cause of depression for most people. So I wouldn't say it's a lack of awareness. I would say, so for example, let's think about a really obvious one, financial insecurity, right? It will come as a no shit Sherlock insight to say to everyone, turns out financial insecurity causes depression and anxiety. Loads of evidence for this and go through it if you want. But to me, it's so obvious. It's one of those things where you talk to the scientists who demonstrated it very clearly and you're like, 
did we really need a scientific study? If I'd asked my grandmother or you'd ask your grandmother, do you think being financially insecure makes you feel worse? My grandmother would have clipped me around the ear and asked why I was wasting her time asking such a stupid and obvious question, right? Actually, my grandmother wouldn't have clipped me around the ear because she would have never done that. But you know what I mean? The, uh, she would have verbally clipped me around the ear. Um, so, and as a society, we've become much more financially insecure. 40% of Australians don't have contracts, right? Are working what in Britain they call zero hour. Sorry, 40%, I think it's between 18 and 25. Uh, are working zero hours contracts, right? That's really anxiety provoking. I'll make you depressed. Now that's not that you're not a lack of awareness on your part. That's because the world has not met your needs, right? Now you could say it's a lack of awareness because the solution is that we need to reform trade unions and fight against employers until they give us contracts, right? I mean, in that sense, yes, we have a collective lack of awareness because again, our heads have been filled with bullshit stories, you know, uh, saying that actually you'll be better off if you don't have any trade unions, if no one is there standing up for you in the workplace, you know, that, that that's the way everyone gets richer, which we know isn't true. Um, so in one sense, it's lack of awareness, but I would say in a broader sense, there are lots of things going on that are making us feel worse. Now, awareness helps, firstly, because you stop blaming yourself. But the main reason why awareness works is because then we can actually build solutions based on what's actually causing these problems, there was a person who really helped me to understand this. It might sound a bit odd um, to say that, but there's a guy I went to interview, a South African psychiatrist called Derek Summerfield. And Derek happened to be in Cambodia in 2001 when they first introduced uh, chemical antidepressants for people in Cambodia. They'd never had them before. And the local doctors, the Cambodians, said to Derek, well, what are they? He didn't, they didn't know, right? And so he explained. And they said to him, oh, we don't need them. We've already got antidepressants. Mm. And he was like, what do you mean? He thought they were going to talk about some kind of herbal remedy like, you know, Ginkgo biloba or something. Instead, they told him a story. There was a farmer in their community who worked in the rice fields. And one day he stood on a landmine and he got his leg blown off. So they gave him an artificial limb and he went back to work in the rice fields. But apparently it's really painful to work underwater when you've got an artificial leg. And I'm guessing it's pretty traumatic to go back to the field where you got fucking blown up. Mm. The guy started to cry a lot. After a while, he just refused to get out of bed in the morning. He developed what we would call classic depression. This is when the Cambodian doctor said to Derek, well, that's when we gave him an antidepressant. Mm. And Derek said, what was it? They explained that they went and sat with him. They listened to him. They realized that his pain made sense, right? You only had to listen to the guy for five minutes to see why he was depressed. One of the doctors um, said, well, if we bought this guy a cow, he could become a dairy farmer. He wouldn't be in this position that was screwing him up so much. So they bought him a cow. Within a couple of weeks, his crying stopped. Within a month, his depression was gone. They said to Derek, so you see, doctor, that cow, that was an antidepressant. That's what you mean, right? Now, if you've been raised to think about depression the way we have, that sounds like a joke. I went to my doctor for an antidepressant. She gave me a cow, right? It sounds absurd. But what those Cambodian doctors knew intuitively from this individual unscientific anecdote is what the leading medical body in the whole world, the World Health Organization, has been trying to tell us for years based on the best science, right? If you're depressed, if you're anxious, you're not weak, you're not crazy, you're not a machine with broken parts, you're a human being with unmet needs. And what you need is practical help to get those needs met. And you notice what those Cambodian doctors didn't say. They didn't say, oh, um, you're depressed because you have to work in this field. Well, good luck solving that, right? The community collectively helped him solve the problem. He needed, he couldn't have solved it on his own. As an isolated individualist, he would have stayed in that field and would have stayed in his bed and would have just cried until, you know, it got worse and worse mm -hmm. as it was doing. And I think in a way, what I'm trying to ask in Lost Connections is, okay, what's the cow for the things that are fucking us up? Right. And some of the things that are making us depressed are bigger for some, not all of them. And we can talk about some of the others, but some of those forces are bigger than, you know, having to work in a field when you've got an, um, an amputated limb. But, you know, we can solve big collective problems together. Uh, we've done it many times. Right. Everyone listening to this is the beneficiary of a collective struggle. I'm gay. Um, you know, when my grandparents were my age, I would have been put in prison for being gay. Now I can get married. Um, women listening to this, you know, I know it's very aggravating to hear a man 
mansplain this, but you know, when my grandmothers were the age I am now, 42, when my Swiss grandmother, my dad's from the Swiss mountains, when my grandmother was the age I am now, she wasn't allowed to vote. Um, she wasn't allowed to have a job outside her home without written permission from her husband. She wasn't allowed, her husband could legally rape her. That was true in Australia as well. That was true in Britain. There were no women running companies. There were no, almost no female police officers. There were no women had ever run a government anywhere in the world with I think one exception, uh, except in a, a hereditary monarch um, and Israel. Um, you know, think about the difference between that and the lives of women now, where, my God, there is still a hell of a lot of, we've got a long way to go till we get um, liberation for and equality for women. But, um, you know, think about the difference between my grandmother's life and my niece's life, her great granddaughter. There's been an enormous change. How did that happen? It happened because ordinary women and some sympathetic men banded together and said, we're not taking this shit anymore. Like what's happening in Australia at the moment, right? We're not going to take this shit anymore. And that works, right? It, there can be setbacks. It takes time, of course. And when you are fighting powerful people, they will fight back and all sorts of things. But we absolutely can change our society and culture and we can deal with a lot of the underlying reasons why depression and anxiety are rising and continuing to rise. That, that's a perfect, um, I just love that, that, that definition. Um, I wanted to clarify something that I sure. said earlier uh, about the, I guess, the, the rape allegations that are happening in, in parliament. And look, I'm not against women's freedoms or liberties at all. What I'm cautious about is, and what I have been seeing and hearing about is it's very fearful for men talking about the conversation of consent and women can, I'm not saying that it's a very fine line and I, I know it's a very difficult conversation to sort of have. And I, I want to be very careful with how I word this, but it's almost like men are, we have this, this fear associated when we go out, we have, we have needs. We, we want to have those needs met 100%. But when we go up to a woman, if we touch a woman in, in the wrong way, if they don't give us that consent to do that, then we can be sued. We can have our lives literally thrown upside down. But then there's also the flip side of that of, I completely understand the, the sexual abuse. Some men do go beyond that and they, they make it worse for the ones that actually do want to do the right thing but sadly they get caught up in the wrong environment or they get, they get accused. And it's always like, okay, how do you know whether someone has actually been like, um, let me, let me, how do you know if someone's actually been raped by another man, whether or not it's just like an accusation or not, whether it's true or false, like that's always been, you, you always give people the benefit of the doubt, no, 100%. But that's what I've always been curious about. And the the rate of uh, suicide among men in, an, in Australia has increased enor enormously because men are constantly subdued that they are not good enough to really go out anymore and be with a woman because it's like almost like what's the point? I can be accused of all this stuff. You know what I mean? I hope I've explained that uh, yeah, I think correctly. I think, Jay, is that I think one of the problems we have at the moment is exactly what you, you're articulating, which is that people are afraid to think these things through out loud. Yeah. And we can only, because we live in a culture where, um, as everyone will have noticed, you don't need me to tell you, where if someone uh, who is good hearted and is trying to think these things through, phrases something in a, um, you know, inelegant or flawed way, rather than trying to persuade that person and going, look, I understand where you're coming from, but maybe you might want to think about it this way. We try to kind of banish them and say, you must be silent forevermore, you're the force of the devil, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and so that, by the way, is not how liberation struggles are won, right? You think about gay, equality to gay, unbelievable advances in how gay people are treated, right? It would have been, un I mean, never mind previous generations, when I was 17 and I first fell in love, the idea that I would have been able to get married to the person that I loved literally never crossed my mind. It didn't even occur to me, 
right? Till I read my friend Andrew Sullivan's book, Virtually Normal, who's the, who wrote the first ever book about gay marriage. And I read that when I was 20. Literally, the idea had never even occurred to me, right? That's how, and I'm not like ancient, right? Think about how recent that is. But the, gay, the struggle for equality for gay people was not won by every time someone thought through their homophobia, we screamed at them and said, you're evil, you must be banished, you must never work again. Um, that, we, and even if we had had, of course, gay people didn't have the power to do that, but even if they had had the power to do that, I don't believe they would have, right? We would have, because that is a catastrophic way of trying. The main thing we have to do is persuade people, right? And um, win people over and change people, right? Um, uh, my friend Eve Ensler wrote a beautiful book about this called The Apology. Eve was sexually abused by her dad when she starting when she was six years old. It's an amazing book. She's an incredible human being, Eve. Um, and, you know, the book is written as a letter. Her father never apologized to her for what he did. He died unrepentant. And Eve said, of course, she believes that men who've committed terrible crimes need to pay a legal penalty and need to be punished, of course. I agree. But she's saying I agree. more than that, what she wanted was for her father to acknowledge what he'd done and apologize. And the book is written imagining she was her father and it's the apology she would have liked to have heard from him. Yeah. And it's very much a book. It really speaks to the debate you're talking about. It's a book that's about what do we want of men, what do women want of men, right? And Eve, of course, speaks much more eloquently to that than, than, than I do. Um, so I would say, of course, when it gets to the point where a man has sexually assaulted a woman, he should be seriously criminally punished. Or indeed, when a man assaults a man or when a woman assaults a woman, although when women assault men is much rarer. But it does occasionally happen. Um, but in a way, that's obvious, right? This, that's obvious. The more interesting thing to me is, how do we reshape a sexual culture so that we have... I think a lot about this about my godsons who are, who are 10 and, and nine and, and are gonna, you know, gonna go out into a world where, you know, they're likely to be heterosexual men and they're gonna, we want, we don't want a Puritan culture where people don't enjoy sexual attraction and, you know, sex is one of the great joys and pleasures of life. Flirtation is one of the great joys and pleasures of life. We want to have healthy flirtations and that's true for men and for women, right? We, we want to have, a healthy sexual culture, um, we've made some advances, but nowhere near enough, right? Uh, we've made some advances, for example, about sexual abuse of children, which was deeply taboo and undiscussed very recently, right? Um, and, and now, of course, it's still a huge problem, but we've made a huge amount of advance on that. Um, and I can talk about how and some of the evidence about uh, childhood sexual abuse and depression later if you want, but I think... People have to feel they can talk through and think th through what they're saying honestly, that they won't be immediately canceled for doing that. We need to tell together better stories about what it means to be a man mm. and better stories about how men and women can be together. There's a really wonderful writer called Lily Boisvert, it's B-O-I-S-V-E-R-T, in, uh, who I met in Montreal, who's written, I think is a really good, uh, I recommend people read her. Um, I can't remember the name of her book, but I think she's only written one. It's called Screwed. It's called Screwed. Um, and uh, she should, you should have her on your podcast. She's really an amazing person. Um, uh, and, and it's a lot about how do we build a healthy sexual culture? Where, as Lily puts it, actually, we all the sexual debate is about, um, at the moment, is about um, consent. She says con consent should be the bare fucking minimum for sex. Obviously you should have consent. What we should be aiming for is not consent, but reciprocity, right? We don't have, when I speak to heterosexual women, a lot of my friends obviously are heterosexual women, and when I speak to heterosexual men, as a gay person, it's slightly different. And the gay people have their own issues around this stuff, of course. Um, it's very striking to me how little sexual reciprocity there seems to be. If you compare, if you think about teenage boys and teenage girls, um, how often boys are getting gone down on and how rarely girls are getting done. In, an, in a reciprocal sexual culture, they, they, those numbers would be equal. 
I think we all know they are way off that, right? Mm. Um, so about how we build those, those cultures together, people have to be able to articulate their fears. Women have to be able to articulate their fears. And women, of course, are the um, bearing the, by far the worst of this. But men also have to be able to articulate their fears. We have to be able to have honest conversations. The vast majority of women want to have honest conversations about this. Cancel culture is a tiny phenomenon of a tiny number of very loud, screaming people who represent almost nobody, who are themselves very unhappy, who've been reprogrammed by uh, social media algorithms that incentivize anger and abuse and aggression. Um, and they need people who are perpetuating that need love and support themselves to get out of this toxic culture that's making them miserable and preventing us from actually making progress on real issues, which is not to say some people don't deserve to be canceled. Of course, some people do things that are so heinous. I'm not saying people don't deserve to be criticized. Of course they do. But we do have to be able to have an honest conversation about these things. We do need to be able to think them through. Um, just having, and we also have a lot of shared pain, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, in all sorts of ways. So we don't want anyone, you know, to be trying to hoard all the pain for one particular aspect of the population. There's a lot of pain to go around. It's not an oppression Olympics, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that there's a lot of, uh, um, pain, pain to go round, and so I think we need to have a a, a a loving, compassionate conversation. You know, every woman loves some men, and every man loves some women. Women, um, and we need to have a conversation that's guided by love and wanting everyone's lives to be better. And I think it's hard to have that conversation in a culture that's driven by a public culture that's driven by Twitter where you just can't, I mean, you could spend a thousand years trying to design a worse place to have a loving, serious conversation and you wouldn't come up with one that was worse than Twitter, right? And if, if that's driving our public conversation, then we're, we just can't do this and we're not gonna have much progress. And actually the progress we get will just trigger backlashes and it'll be ugly. And um, so, yeah, I think we both agree it's a complicated conversation. Obviously the first principle should be, um, bare minimum for every sexual act should be consent but we and we're not there we're not anywhere near there but actually that's just that should only be the the low bar how do we get a, a culture where boys get rewarded not for how many you know girls they got to suck their cock but how many girls they got to have an orgasm you know it really wanted them it, there's a whole change in the sexual culture or how many women they made to feel good about themselves right there's a whole change in the car, not just sexually, but, you know, emotionally, romantically, there's a whole, and I'm aware, I'm very conscious that a lot of women hearing this will find it very aggravating for a man to, to be talking about this because they're much better able to do it. And I would say, read Eve, read Lily. There's a whole range of uh, great, amazing women who are, who are leading the conversation. But, but yeah, I think you're totally, I think your instincts are right. And we need to have honest conversations and we need to start from the premise that We've all, men and women, have been poisoned by stories about gender that are unhealthy, and we need to find a better story to tell together that will make everyone happier. I don't believe it's, as, it's definitely not a zero-sum game. A lot of men have been taught it's a zero-sum game, right? Women gain, you lose. That is not true, right? My life is better. My grandfather's life was worse because his wife was not free. She was really unhappy. Her life was so demanding. My grandmother wanted to be an artist, right? She loved drawing, she loved painting. But from when the moment she was married, she was basically like a prisoner, right? And that made her really miserable. It meant she treated some of her kids quite badly, although she was actually a very kind person. And it meant that my grandfather's life was much worse. They would both have been happier if they were free from that prison. In the same way that race is a story, it diminishes all of us, these, these stupid oppressive stories that justify, were designed to justify Oppression. So it's a very long answer to your. Sorry. No, no. I think you just articulated everything that I was trying to articulate better than I did. <laughs> so I appreciate you like wrapping all that up for me and and bundling it up in a much better better package <laughs> for for everyone to understand. And I think I just don't want. I want to have these conversations, but at the same time, I'm afraid to harm another person like with 
yeah, I don't want to hurt anyone at all. Like I want to give people the benefit of the doubt. I want people to be able to express themselves, express the hurt. I want people to, you know, not judge another person for what they've been through. I want there to be consent 1000%. I want there to be, okay, if something has happened to another human being that is wrong, I want there to be justice. But then again, it brings down the question of is what is real justice? Can there be equal justice or is it just justice for one person? Uh, a whole range of questions that I have. And this is, this is one of the reasons why I love having these kinds of conversations. I mean, we're talking about it in the very beginning when you asked me, what are my favorite conversations? Um, and this is one of them, you know, like this is because this is important. It's not, it's an issue that is happening everywhere in society. And I think there needs to be more leading voices to stand up, not be afraid and we need to start sharing better stories. And that's why I love stories because they have that power, that innate ability to change and to move people in different ways. And it's like, are we going to move people? Are we going to tell the right stories that are going to move people in the best way possible? And it's going to shape uh, improvement or are we going to uh, continue belittling people and making them feel like they are worthless and we're not giving them a place in society. Um, that's, that's what I, I want to try and, and bring awareness to at the same time. And I think it's also about accepting one another for who we are at the end of the day, we're all created equal. Like when you strip away everyone's works at the end of the day, we're all, we're all human. That's where we should be connecting on once again is the fact that nobody, nobody is better than another person. Doesn't matter how much money you've got in your bank account. Doesn't matter what possession, what house you've got, what works you've actually done, how much you've impacted society and bring it to this, this sense of humaneness of just being a kind, friendly, I mean, being friendly means has the word friend in it. And you can even go further into what actually it means to be a friend, but ultimately it comes down to accepting, being kind, being uh, just, yeah, nice to people. And uh, I think that if we were to all do that, then society will be a little, little better because we do have different beliefs and that kind of conflicts with another person's beliefs. But what if we had just had like, if we had a disagreement and you say, Hey, I, I disagree with you. Like even, even doing uh, th this Johan and having conversations with people, I don't agree with everything that people say, but it is not my job to tell them, Hey, I disagree with you. And then we get into this long argument debate. What does that accomplish? It's like, well, it's you are that, Jay, like actually encountering people who are different to you is the great joy of life. Right. Exactly. Like, my idea of hell would be to be stuck in a room with people who just agreed with everything I said, right? <laughs> like, but actually, the, the whole point of life is to explore people who, you know, a world that is not you, right? Mm -hmm. And it's actually, you know, we're talking about this individualism. It's actually a weird form of narcissism to demand that everyone agree with you all the time. And if they don't, then they must be evil, right? It's a very unhealthy culture. And as I said, that makes people unhappy, right? When I think one of the, when we look at this rise of, um, you know, a culture built around uh, a, a public culture that increasingly celebrates humiliation and cruelty and cancelling people and making them feel banished. Um, there's lots of things to blame for that. Partly it's, we should remember these, these websites are designed, the algorithms are designed to accentuate anger because that keeps people scrolling longer. So that's partly people are being reprogrammed so that Mark Zuckerberg and other people can get richer even when they're already richer than almost any human being has ever lived yep. um, than the richest pharaoh. Um, so it's partly that. It's partly a way of dealing with unhappiness, you know. Um, anger gives you temporary, anger is a very short acting antidepressant, but it does work. You know, if you get really angry for a moment, you're not so sad. Um, there's James Baldwin, one of my favorite writers wrote, he was talking about uh, white racists, but he, it applies in this context. He said, 
The reason they're so angry is because if they weren't angry, they'd have to feel their pain. And I think there's a lot of anger at the moment because it protects people from pain for a short period of time. Of course, in the long term, it deepens everyone's pain. So I think, I think, I think you're right. And I think we need to have these conversations in sane ways. And the vast majority of people want that, right? The vast majority of people want to listen to each other and want to, don't want to scream and shout when people are different. They want to listen to each other, they want to hear each other. Most of us acknowledge an obvious truth, which is the main reason you should listen to other people is because they might be right. <laughs> you know, like actually, you know, I don't think everything I thought five years ago, I don't think everything I thought a year ago, right? Of course, listen to other people because you could be wrong. You certainly are wrong about lots of things, right? I am certainly wrong about lots of things. Everyone is certainly wrong about lots of things. You, you need to, um, there's a kind of arrogance in a culture that assumes that you can tell everyone else what to think because you're obviously the better person and you're right. And they're obviously wrong. Um, which of course isn't to say there shouldn't be moral boundaries and that there shouldn't be some, co- shouldn't be consequences for people who harm other people. But we, in pursuit of that, we shouldn't become so high on our own righteousness or so, or think that license is cruelty of our own, right? That's not, that's not a healthy, it's not a healthy culture and it won't lead to a more liberated um, way of living f- or, or more healthy and respectful way of living for, for all of us. No. You know, I was thinking this, it relates to something about, I was thinking about, and I know you've talked very bravely about this in previous podcasts. Partly what you're saying is at the moment, we've got a culture that is primarily dealing with these problems by making people feel ashamed. Yeah. And there's really interesting research about shame. And it relates to one of the causes of depression that I write about in Lost Connections. Um, and to explain how it was discovered, this science, I have to tell you a story that for a minute you're going to think, what well, the fuck is he talking about? Why is he telling me this? But just stick with me because it, it, I don't think you can really understand it if you don't understand how it was discovered. So in the mid-1980s, a doctor called Vincent Felitti, who I interviewed a lot, long, long time later, was approached and given a quite difficult task. He was approached by Kaiser Permanente, who were a big not-for-profit medical provider in California. And they said, look, we've got a problem we don't know what to do about. We've got uh, obesity is just getting worse and worse. Actually, it's gone off a cliff since then. I mean, massively risen since then, sorry. Um, As you know, but by then it was rising and rising. And they were like, look, we give people nutritional advice. We explain why they're getting gaining weight. Nothing works. They just, so they just gave him a shit ton of money and they said, go away, do blue skies research, figure out what the hell we can do. So they go, so Dr. Felita goes away and he's like, what can I do with this money? So he starts to work with 250 severely obese people, people who weigh more than 400 pounds. So people who are in real danger of, of death. Um, and they tried everything and nothing had worked. So Dr. Felita's trying to think, what can I do? And he's interviewing them. And one day he has an idea that seems, and in fact is quite stupid. Uh, He asked himself, what would happen if really obese people literally just stopped eating? And we gave them like vitamin C shots so they didn't get scurvy. We gave them, you know, the right nutrients. Would they just burn through the fat supplies in their body and lose weight? And incredibly, at first it worked. There's a woman who I'm going to call Susan. That's not her real name. It's to protect her confidentiality. Who went from being more than 400 pounds to 138 pounds. Incredible, right? She's like, you saved my life. Her family are ringing Dr. Felitti saying, you saved her life. And then one day something happened that no one expected. Susan cracked. She went to KFC. Actually, it wasn't KFC. That's me projecting. It was somewhere, somewhere like <laughs> Taco Bell, whatever it was, um, and starts obsessively eating. And quite soon she's not quite where she was, but she's back at a dangerous weight. And Dr. Felitti called her in. He said, Susan, what happened? And she looked down. She said, I don't know. I don't know. And he said, well, tell me about the day you cracked. What happened that day? Mm. Turned out something had happened that day that had never happened to Susan before. She was in a bar and a man hit on her. Not in a horrible way, not in a predatory way, quite a nice way. But she felt really freaked out. She went and she started obsessively eating. That's when Dr. Felitti asked her, Susan, when did you start gaining your weight? In her case, it was when she was um, 11. And he said to her, well, did anything happen when you were 11 that didn't happen when you were nine, when you were 14, anything happened that year? And Susan looked down and she said, well, that's when my grandfather started to rape me. Dr. Felitti interviewed everyone in the program. 
he discovered that 60% of them had made their extreme weight gain in the aftermath of being sexually abused or assaulted. And he's like, what is this? I don't understand what's happening. And Susan explained to him really well. She said, overweight is overlooked and that's what I need to be. Obviously, if you gain a huge amount of weight in our culture, most men are not going to hit on you. This thing that appeared so, um, so irrational, and of course is bad for your health, actually was performing a protective function that these women needed, right? Mm. Um, one of the people, one of the other scientists involved in that program, Dr. Robert Ander, said to me, he realized it was like there was a house fire and we've been concentrating on putting out the smoke instead of dealing with the fire. He said he realized we have to stop asking when we see someone who's depressed or addicted or, or obese or, or whatever it might be, we need to stop asking what's wrong with you and start asking what happened to you. Yeah. But the reason this connects to what you were saying and this culture of shame is because of what they discovered next, right? So they now had... So, so Dr. Felitti goes to uh, the Center for Disease Control, who fund a huge amount of medical research. And he got a shit ton of funding. This has been, up to then, it had been a small study, 250 people. He gets a shit ton of money so that everyone who came for medical care in San Diego for a whole year got given a questionnaire. It didn't matter what you came in for, broken legs, schizophrenia, anything. The first part asked, did any of these 10 bad things happen to you when you were a kid? Things like um, sexual abuse, neglect, emotional cruelty, that kind of thing. And the second part asked, have you had any of these problems as an adult? Things like, initially it was just going to be obesity, but luckily for us, they added at the last minute, depression, suicide attempts, addiction, uh, addiction to injecting drugs, that kind of thing. And if, when they added up the figures after this year-long study, at first they thought there'd been some mistake. For every category of childhood trauma you experienced, you were two to four times more likely to become depressed, anxious, or addicted. But when you got into the multiple, cat when you had many categories of childhood trauma, figures just blew up. If you had six categories of childhood trauma, you were 3,100% more likely to have attempted suicide, and you were 4,600% more likely to have a problem with injecting, uh, being addicted to injecting, injecting injectable drugs. And I remember, this might sound weird, but when I, I went to interview Dr. Felitti in San Diego and uh, he's a lovely old man. He's quite old by the time. I think he was 83 or 84 when I interviewed him. Lovely, decent person. You'd really like him. Hugely admirable. And I, I was, as he was describing this to me, I was so angry that I actually ended the interview early because I, I was getting so angry and I, I, could, I wasn't communicating to him, but I could feel my whole body tensing up. And I remember going to the beach in San Diego and thinking, God, why am I so angry with this lovely old man who discovered this really important research? When I was a child, I'd experienced some, as I know you did, some very extreme things from an adult in my life. Um, and it's funny, you know, if I think about it now, when I went to my doctor, my doctor, and I was a teenager, and now looking back, it was clearly connected that I was so depressed and found it so difficult to trust people. My doctor, who's a stress is a decent person, this is not a diss on, diss on my doctor, but never even said to me, is there any reason you might feel like this, right? Now, to be honest, I don't think I would have been able to talk about it then, but it might have at least opened up a way of thinking about this pain. What, what my doctor did by saying it was purely a biological problem, and I stress again, there are some biological contributions, but by saying it was a purely biological problem, what my doctor, it's not, not at all my doctor's intention, but what effectively it was saying to me was, your pain doesn't mean anything. Right? It's like a glitch in a computer program. Um, but the reason I'm really glad I stayed with this, I went back and carried on interviewing Dr. Felitti, is because of what he discovered next, which is really important. And this is where it ties in, sorry, finally, to what you were saying. So they suddenly had all these questionnaires where loads of people had said that they'd been abused as children. So their doctors were told, next time they come in, don't call them back, but next time they come in, say to them something like this, I see that when you were a child, you were sexually abused or whatever it was. I'm really sorry that happened to you. That should never have happened. You should have been protected from that. Would you like to talk about it? And 40% of people said they didn't want to talk about it, but 60% of them did. And they wanted to talk about it on average for five minutes. And then in this study, it was randomized. Some of them were given the option of going to see a therapist to talk about it more. What was incredible was 
just those five minutes of an authority figure saying, I'm so sorry this happened to you. That should never have happened. That alone led to a significant fall in depression and anxiety. And the people who got referred to a therapist got an even bigger fall. And this fits with a much wider body of research from people like Professor Steve Coles, who I interviewed at UCLA, which shows it's not the trauma that destroys you. It's the shame about the trauma. Shame destroys people physically, mentally. Professor Coles did this study of uh, AIDS patients at the height of the AIDS crisis in the 80s. And he found that openly gay men died on average two years later than closeted gay men, even when they got healthcare at exactly the same time. Why would that be? Shame fucks you. It fucks your body, it fucks your mind, it makes it impossible to deal with anything. What, what that program did when the doctor said, I'm sorry this happened to you, it was a way of releasing shame. Uh, Professor James Pennebaker at Florida State University has also done really important research on this. It cannot be that the way we will deal with this problem is primarily by shaming people, right? That is not how you solve things. Now, of course, there are some shameful acts. Of course, it's, it's a good thing in our culture that we've put uh, an even bigger um, stigma around sexual abuse of children. Of course, there are things that have to be, there are people who have to be stopped. There are people who do terrible things. And, and, and there are times when shame is an appropriate tool, but shame is a short-term tool to stop something. When you're reconstructing a human, you won't do that primarily by shame. You do that by offering modes of connection and love and finding different and better stories we can all tell about who we are. Um, so I, I think it's really important to understand that evidence about how shame is actually really a, ultimately a destructive force if it's applied blanketly and for too long. Now, of course, there's a big difference between the shame of being abused and the shame of being an abuser. And it's right that abusers should feel ashamed of what they've done. I don't want to be misunderstood. But, but that's just one part of it, right? We, a debate that where it feels like in our public culture at the moment, the only tool we have is shame, right? It's the one thing we do is shame people. That, that's not how we're going to get somewhere better, right? Shame, may be, shame will be one component of change, but it's a small component and we need all the other stuff. Does that, does that make sense, Jay? 1,000% it does. Because I even loved how you you said we're dealing with the smoke, but not really dealing with the fire. And I talk about it in my first book in the challenges section, because yeah, I was I was sexually abused when I was six, and then what I talk about straight after that is it was almost like I was living in these days for a very long time that my own mind created. I was afraid of opening up to anyone because I was afraid, hey, it was, a, it was a teenage boy. And what does that mean? What does that look like for me? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a guy. Another guy has touched me inappropriately. What does that, what does that mean for me? So I didn't, so my brain, instead of dealing with it, instead of talking through it, it, it subdued it. And that trauma eventually, when it, it would come up at different points in my life, but I didn't actually know that it was, I, I, I sort of, my brain had sort of like tried to forget about it. Like it even, it even happened, but at different points in my life, there would be like little moments where I get these like little flashbacks of what, would, what happened. And I'd be like, Oh, what's that? I didn't, where did that come from? And then more recently, this last year around father's day that it was almost like, the realization moment happened when I got up the courage to ask the question to someone that actually knew that it happened. And it was like this light bulb moment. The days had, had just completely gone and it was like my eyes were opened and a lot of things just made sense. The depression, the anxiety, the stress, the uh, wanting to be a certain person, but the fear of what people would think of me, perfectionism, all this stuff, it can you can boil it all down to that one little traumatic experience. I'm not saying it was little, but uh, that one experience, right? And then just moving forward from that, how am I going to really deal with it moving moving forward in my life? I guess you could you could say, and like I'm not a victim, I'm a victor. That's the way I look at it now, and I'm not ashamed at all to talk about what happened uh 
some people might feel like I can't talk about it, but like going back to before, we need to have these conversations in order to help each other not feel ashamed. That if you've been through something like this, you shouldn't feel ashamed at all. And there are many reasons why you shouldn't. And for the, I think the, the shame element that you're talking about is extremely true. And also the, the person that has done the act should be 1000%. I'm reiterating what you're saying. They, there should be punishment. Uh, I, I believe, and this is just my personal belief, I, I believe they should be castrated um, for what they did as a punishment because no one should ever, ever have to experience that. No one should ever have to go through that level of trauma, that level of pain and have to deal with it because the side effects, my goodness, they're far, far worse and they, they last a very, very long time. Yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry that happened to you, Jay, and you should be really proud of yourself for overcoming that and using that pain to help other people. And um, I think one of the things as well, one of the reasons why it's so important for people who've been abused, um, you know, I don't... It's a difficult thing to talk about publicly, isn't it? And I, the reason I forced myself to do it um, is that I'd like to say it's a benevolent thing about helping other people. And that is part of my motive, but actually there is a thing about for myself, uh, one of the effects of abuse. So very often, uh, usually particularly sexual abuse, as far as sexual abuse are usually told some variant of you made me do this. Right. Um, and and like I say, Eve, my friend who wrote the apology, who writes about this really well. Um, and um, people very often who've been abused will internalize that voice. They believe that about themselves, especially when you're a child. You don't, you don't know that that's not, you know, I, when I was a child, I believed Australia existed because adults told me it did, right? I hadn't been to Australia. You know, you, you absorb what adults tell you um, and you assume it's right in most cases. So if you're told by an abuser, you deserve this, there's something wrong with you, you know, you made me do it. Of course, that becomes part of your self-concept, your self-perception. And of course, as an adult, when you say it out loud, you, you realize that's absurd, right? If you said to me now, you know, um, I did this to a child because they deserved it, I would, I, I, there's no, you know, there's a bit of me that would agree with you. I'd be like, Jay, we need to talk. You, you need to get some help, right? Um, so I think articulating the voice of the abuser in a safe context, of course, you don't want to be doing it with, I don't know, if someone is replicating the abuse and a lot of people who've been abused seek out people who replicate abuse in various ways, but seeking out places where you can talk about it and see that it won't, um, see that actually the abuser was just that an abuser and was not a representative was not telling a deeper truth. They were telling whatever enabled them to justify and in inverted commas, what they were doing. So I totally understand where that, I agree with everything you're saying. I, I understand where that, I understand where that point about castration comes from. Actually the evidence, I mean, I think, I don't think that's a good idea for two reasons. One is because I think people, uh, even people who do terrible, terrible things have some rights, but also, Actually, there have been studies of this in places where they've done chemical castration, where they mm. give sex offenders drugs that mean they can't get it up. And it turns out that they're, they're actually the rate of reoffending re doesn't fall. Um, they just abuse people with objects or whatever, because actually that abuse is not about, I think it's a misunderstanding, an understandable misunderstanding, but an understanding that sexual abuse is primarily about sexual pleasure. Um, whereas actually more it's about replicating abuse they've experienced or exercising power or release in catastrophic ways, ex expelling negative energies from themselves or whatever. So I don't think that solution works, but there are solutions that work. I mean, the most important thing, and, and actually this is one area in which our culture has got better, is to identify sexual abuse early. So you think about, do you know about the Jimmy Savile scandal in Britain? No, no. This is a very hard thing to explain to people who are not British, but... 
So there's a man called Jimmy Savile, who, when I was a kid, was the most popular person in Britain. So he presented the Top of the Pops, the main music show. Uh, he And he presented the main children's TV show, the most popular children's TV show, which was called Jim Will Fix It, where every child in Britain wrote to him and said a dream, like, I want to have my whole body, a replica of my whole body made out of chocolate, or I want to drive a steam train or whatever, and he would fix it for you, right? He also famously raised huge amounts of money for charity. So he was literally the most admired man in Britain. He died six years ago, I think. And it emerged in the aftermath of his death that he had been the most prolific um, child molester and depraved sexual maniac in British history. He raped over 1,500 children. His show where kids wrote to him was partly a front so he could rape these children. He wow. raped dead bodies. He raped, I mean, like he's like a, it, it's imp- very hard to get your head around how insane this man was. And there's a book about him written by a guy called Dan David, excellent, very disturbing book about him called Hidden in Plain Sight, The Life and Lies of Jimmy Savile. Um, and anyway, the reason I mentioned it in this context is it turned out when he died, all throughout, he started sexually abusing people as far as we know in the 1950s and died six years ago. Um, all throughout his life, there were people who went to the authorities. To, now, there were a lot of people who were sexually abused. Who, it wasn't even a vocabulary of sexual abuse, right? Until very recently, a lot of children who were sexually abused didn't even, in a way that, um, you know, if, uh, God forbid, when an eight-year-old is abused now, they, they have a vocabulary for what's happened to them because they, it's in the culture, it's in the schools. Um, a lot of so a lot of the victims of Jimmy Savile didn't even have a language to describe what he'd done to them. But it turns out there were people going right back to the 60s who did go to the police. There was an attitude of they're obviously lying. This is, you know, um, a child against this great man who's Sir Jimmy Savile, who's friends with Margaret Thatcher and Prince Charles. How could that be? But also there was an element, a really, uh, in some ways, even sadder element than that, than the kind of cover up element, which was there was this belief that if it, it was about a kind of a attitude towards virginity that we fortunately don't have now, which was like this idea that if a child had been, if a girl had been sexually abused, she had been ruined, right? And no man would want her. I think, I think about in relation to the fact when Princess Diana marries Charles in 1981, her uncle goes on television, she was 19, her uncle goes on television a few nights before the wedding to reassure the country she's a virgin, right? Think about how fucking creepy and weird that is. I cannot imagine that anyone asked if Meghan Markle was a virgin when she married <laughs> Diana's son, right? Um, so you think about that, that really, these really sick ideas uh, about, you know, uh, that children invited abuse, that if they were abused, they were ruined, that you were doing the child a favor if you didn't tell anyone, if you didn't punish the perpetrator. All of those ideas, those ideas are gone now in the culture, even quite extreme people, you don't hear that anymore, right? There's no, uh, you, you, you still hear some excuses for sexual abuse, but they're much rarer. It was perfectly normal for, I mean, in the light of the Jimmy Savile scandal, one of the things that happened is all these interviews came to light of, famous musicians boasting about having had sex with underage teenagers. And it was just sort of seen as like a joke. I mean, one of the things about Jimmy Savile is he was quite, he was kind of openly a paedophile. He would talk about what he did. And there was a degree to which I think some people thought it was a joke. And some people thought, and sexual abuse was so taboo that people just assumed it, it wasn't true or it was some level of bluff or, or just didn't think about it at all. Right. Just didn't think about it. Um, so, one of the good things we've done as a culture is start talking about sexual abuse and the harm sexual abuse does, um, which makes it is the, the necessary first step to, to deal with it. But it comes back to this question we were asking about as well, about abuse where adults commit abuse against other adults. The, the single best thing is to identify people who have been abused early and give them a lot of care and also identify people who are at risk of becoming abusers and give them huge amounts of support. Um, the, the, the most, you know, to inter- the earlier you intervene, the more you can lead to positive outcomes. Um, and there's loads of evidence about this. A brilliant British woman called Camilla Batman-Gellid has done research on this. Um, 
so that you, you've got to intervene early and spending money early on this stuff makes a huge difference. It's why the fact that our governments keep cutting child protection budgets is such a, a tragedy because you, if you get in early, you can make a, a really big difference. Uh, Jay, I should just say, I should go in about uh, five minutes if that's all right. That's okay with you, man. I, I'm happy to crash it. I can, uh, I can we're, feel my ability to speak will run out soon. <laughs> we've been almost talking for two hours and it's gone oh, It's gone so quick. Um, really enjoy this. But to wrap it all up, uh, I have one final question for you. This is my all-time favorite question. And I've definitely got to have you back on again um, to continue this conversation. But final question is, uh, it's a hypothetical one, but I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic for the sake of argument, but they've been able to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? As a British writer called Huxley who... Uh, when he was dying, I'm not comparing myself to him. I want to be clear about that. I'm just, this is a thing he said. He said, all the things I've ever done, all the things I've ever achieved, the only thing I'm proud of is showing a little bit of kindness to people. Um, and I would hope they would think about moments when I was kind to them, which are not enough. You know, I haven't done that enough in my life, but... Um, yeah, I think it's times, just times when you're glad, happy when they're succeeding or when someone you love is in pain and you either sit with them and make it a bit easier or you help them. Um, I would like to think, yeah, I would like to think they would think about that. It's a beautiful way to sort of wrap up our conversation today. Johan Hari, thank you. For coming uh, on thank the you podcast. And my um, my publishers tase me if I don't say at the end of everything I'm on uh, that I meant to say, what am I meant to say? They give me like a script, I can't remember it. I meant to say, if you want any more information about me, if you want to see where you can follow me on social media uh, uh, or how you can get the audio book or the book of either of the books we've been talking about, one about depression, one about addiction, you can go to www.johanhari.com. It's J-O-H-A-N-N-H-A-R-I.com. Although I got in trouble on a podcast a while back because at the end they said to me, so what's your Facebook? And I said it, I can't remember what it is, it's on the website. They said, what's your Twitter? What's your Instagram? And I said, all them. And they said, what's your Snapchat? And I was like, I'm a 42-year-old man, right? The only 42-year-old men on Snapchat should be immediately put in prison, right? <laughs> but they are not there for good reasons, right? So you can follow me on those things, but you cannot follow me on Snapchat because, you know, um, oh, I'm 42. <laughs> exactly. My niece is coming to, uh, uh, I'm going to see my niece in the park tomorrow. And um, she keeps trying to persuade me to set up a TikTok. And oh. I'm like, I, will, I won't go there. No. Don't, don't like, do it. Yeah. Yeah. People will buy your book. I'm like, I don't care. I don't care. I don't want this in my head. <laughs> They'll buy it in other ways. Just don't get on TikTok. <laughs> uh, like, we've got a limited amount of time to be alive. Yep. The clock is constantly fucking ticking down. And then you'll be dead forever. Right? Yep. I don't need another social media platform. That's it. I got off. Exactly right, man. Johan, thank, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Jay. I really enjoyed this. Cheers. <laughs>